So I've been traveling through time from the 1820s till 1990. We've been searching through history to find out where our technology came from. In that time, we've seen war, social change, and uncertain times that sparked revolutionary ideas that changed the world as we know it. How did we get where we are today? And what's in store for the future? What kind of things do we have to look forward to? In this program, we'll keep moving and we'll find the answer. Continuing on in our journey, we find ourselves at the start of what some call the last great decade, the 1990s. Here we'll begin to see the world shrink rapidly as we enter the information age, sharing whatever information we want instantly. But wait, even this was amazing. In the 90s, the whole world was connected for the very first time, but how did it happen? There's no doubt that the one driving force behind the world getting smaller was the public emergence of the internet. The story of the internet itself is quite long and complicated and will not fit the format or the nature of this program, so we're only going to really touch on the basic key points. The story does end up being quite fascinating though. Just think about this story the next time you're browsing the internet. It all started in 1957 when the Russians launched the Sputnik satellite. Much like the first man in space and the initial acceptance of the integrated circuit, it was once again the Russians that indirectly started a technological revolution. Much like the rest of the United States, President Eisenhower went into a panic and commissioned the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, to compete with the Russians. The Americans needed an indestructible communications network that would stay up and running even though part of the network was destroyed by a Soviet attack. How could this be done? Well, the answer came from a ridiculously unexpected source. A mouse. A mouse in a maze, to be exact. An ARPA employee, Paul Buran, looked at the way a mouse moved through a maze and decided to model its behavior as the basis of the new information network. And said, well, if we can model a mouse going through a maze, then we should be able to do the same with information. It's still just incredible to think that the very early ideas of the internet came from a mouse. The mouse in a maze idea was refined and developed further on throughout the 60s. In 1968, ARPA was finally ready to connect some computers together and start the network. A few members of the ARPA team went to contact some telephone companies to get the project off the ground. But the telephone companies couldn't understand or see the use of connecting computers together in a network. They didn't see that it was very important for mainstream. I mean, after all, communications, well, we've, got, we've got our own communication systems here at IBM, and AT&T does the telephone system. Hey, what else do we need? What's your problem? So ARPA ended up finishing up the job themselves with the help of some small firms. In 1969, while everyone was focusing on man landing on the moon, an extremely important event happened. Four computers were linked up together, and the ARPANET was born. Just have a wild guess as to what the ARPANET later became. The amazing thing was, nobody really owned it. It had an open nature, which meant that anyone could make changes and make comments on it. And this was key. We still hold this key idea and value today in ARPANET's descendant, the internet. In 1971, there were 18 computers on the ARPANET network. And by 1972, networks began to spring up all around the Western world. But there was a problem. Each and every single one of those networks spoke a different language, so they couldn't interconnect and understand each other. This meant that there were technically hundreds of different internets, and this wasn't much use. So in 1983, this problem was finally solved with the introduction of a universal protocol. And since that year, the world has just had one internet, and now we're all connected. As revolutionary as an endless supply of newfound information was, it was largely impractical because everything was extremely hard to find. To even be able to use the internet, you needed to be fluid in text commands and a literal computer expert. Enter Tim Berners-Lee. 
This guy invented something that we use each and every day, probably more than most other things, without even thinking about it. He invented the World Wide Web. Basically, he created the web page and also pioneered the idea of clicking on a link and getting from one place to another. So, on the 6th of August 1991, he gave out his invention free to the world so it would grow, and grow it did. The internet was still mostly private though, but in 1992 it became public. Back then, there were only 50 websites, and most of the internet was still text-based, and it was hard to use. Let me show you what I mean. This is how the internet worked before web browsers. This will blow your mind. What's the big deal about internet? Why is everybody making such a fuss about it? Why is it better than CompuServe or Prodigy, etc.? Well, the chief benefit is that it's not owned by one company or even a conglomerate of companies like Prodigy or CompuServe. You're influenced by what those companies thought your users would want to do. Where on the internet, anyone can put any service on and have it do anything they want with it at so any time. It's kind time. of user controlled. Right. It's, it's completely molded by the people who use yeah. it. All right, let's take a look and show me some of the neat things you can do on the internet. Okay, the first thing we'll be doing is looking for a job a friend of, for a friend of mine who ha just got her teacher's certificate and she's in the Northeast. So we'll be using a tool called Gopher which lets you burrow around the internet and pop up where the information you need happens to be. And we're going into the Online Career Center. And this will let you search the job listings. It'll also you let you search resumes if you're looking for people to work for you. Uh -huh. And here we'll search for the word teacher. It'll go and perform the search. So you're looking for a teacher's job in the Northeast? Here we've got a wow. small list of, of positions. And let's say she wants to be a substitute teacher. At the Bayview Health Care Center, we'll get the list of contact information, the phone number, the requirements, salary, that kind of thing. It's pretty neat in itself. All this changed in 1993 when the first proper web browser was released. It was called Mosaic, but its name was later changed to Netscape. Mosaic is one of those new developments. It's a hypertext interface that lets you browse any information service provided by the internet. Mosaic was developed by the National Center for Supercomputing Applications with ARPA's support. The thing that makes Mosaic special is that it gives everyone access without there having to be uh, a, a rocket scientist, they don't have to be trained, in, because it's a point and click interface. Uh, and that point and click, instead of going through information that's on your personal computer, it's as if there's a million computers on the internet inside your own personal computer. These top level researchers hope Mosaic lures more average computer users to the internet for the very first time, people could scroll, view pictures and text, and click to links and go to other web pages instantly. It sounds ridiculously simple now, but back then, it was a revolution and it changed the world. No one had ever seen anything like it. We had entered the information age and there was no turning back. And with that, let's move on. But quickly before we do, let's take a look at something quite fascinating. This is the 1993 take of Internet Society. You'll quickly be able to see that the attitudes of people back then were completely different to what they are now on the Internet. I mean, there's not a lot of cursing or swearing. There's not a lot of um, personal um, cuts. There's not a lot of um, put-downs that one would expect to find. There's not, you know, there's not screenfuls of, you know, go to hell, uh, um, which is surprising. So the kind of liberation is, is, is is mixed. It's, it's interesting because one would think if you're anonymous you do anything you want. And that kind of view is almost laughable now. It's completely the opposite today. Okay, so moving on. By the mid to late 1990s there was a whole lot of information and it needed to be organized desperately. There were internet search engines around but they all didn't really perform and left many users frustrated. It took two Stanford PhD dropouts to change all of that. Their names were Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Like the changes that happened to the personal computer in the 70s, these two guys would single-handedly start a revolution that would change the world at breakneck speed this time. In 1996, they brought all of the world's information closer together with a thing called Backrub, or as we know it today, Google. Google was officially launched in 1998. Back then it was just a search engine, but as we know today, it's a lot more than just that. Well, how big exactly is Google? What would happen if all of Google's services suddenly disappeared all at once? 
Well, this exact scenario happened on the 17th of August 2013, and these were the results. This is amazing. On this day, an unprecedented outage happened. Google Search, Gmail, YouTube, Google Drive, and most of Google's services had a blackout for just two minutes, and in that short time, 40% of the world's internet traffic disappeared. Google is even bigger than we think. Pretty thought-provoking stuff, but we've got to keep going. Let's move on to the 2000s. Looking at the state of the world at the beginning of the 2000s, and then looking back again at the end of the 2000s, it was like a different planet. Anyway, in 2000, Apple was still doing pretty badly, and they needed something to pick themselves up. Steve Jobs had been re-elected as CEO, and had been back at the helm of the company since 1997. He was looking to enter the largely untapped market of digital portable music. It had been done before by other companies, but never well. He needed an outstanding idea that could not fail. This was Apple's last chance. It's a long story, but it actually turns out that the original brainchild for the iPod's design, and even iTunes way of music distribution, can be traced back to the 1979 invention of the digital audio player by British inventor Kane Kramer. The iPod really came at the right time. It's actually said that Apple's board members were actually considering shutting down the company, closing doors, and selling Apple. But how did the iPod become so intensely popular? One area was its ease of use and navigation. Back in 2001, with most MP3 players, you had to manually click to each song. And if you had a thousand songs, well forget about it. But the scroll wheel changed all of that. The second reason to why the iPod was so popular? The headphones. Nobody was selling MP3 players, CD players, or Walkmans with white headphones. So each and every time a person walked down the street with these crazy white headphones that stood out from everything else, other people just had to ask, what is that? And that curiosity helped fuel the hype for the iPod. It was so successful that it went on to become one of the most culturally recognized items of the decade. When Apple finally acknowledged that Kane Kramer was the original brainchild, they gave him a free iPod. It stopped working eight months later. The iPod took over the world and brought Apple back into the limelight for the first time in over a decade. The music industry had been conquered. The next target? The mobile phone. Do you remember Nokia? Of course you do. It wasn't long ago that Nokia was like the Nike, Coke, Mercedes or BMW of the mobile phone industry. This was pretty much the way it always was. But on September 2nd, 2013, Microsoft bought Nokia for less than $8 billion. That's right, Nokia as a mobile company does not exist anymore. The huge billion dollar companies of yesteryear certainly aren't what they used to be. But how did this happen? In 2007, the world was looking for a brand new approach to the mobile phone. The start of the answer just needed a company to be at the right place at the right time with the right product. I think we're going to hit a grand slam with this. The new must-have device that takes the iPod even further. No buttons on the front. You'll notice that's a key differentiator. All touchscreen. Gadget fans will want one, but will it ever reach a wider market? $100 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard. Whether you love the iPhone or you hate it, there's no denying that back then in 2007 when the iPhone was launched, it showed a sign of the way things would work from then on. Even though people hated the way Steve Jobs ran his company, people just had to hand it to him that this all-touch screen slate phone 
was an interesting enough device, even though it cost $600 on a two-year contract for the 8GB model. But it was really some good marketing and some little fine details that really made the iPhone sell like hotcakes. Magic comes when you use your finger on that thing. You scroll lists like by flicking like this, and it's like a roulette wheel. It goes stop like that. It's just so cool. If it wasn't for the breakthrough of the App Store, the iPhone could have just been one of those devices which just looked cool and was cool to use, but just didn't catch on. The App Store made all the difference. Uh, what Apple marketed was that there were web apps. Uh, what would happen is you'd open Safari and you would go to a website that was designed for iPhone and you could have HTML based games and calendars and applications. Obviously this didn't roll over well because Apple announced the App Store, but for the first year, uh, there was no App Store. It's amazing how many people actually forget. For one entire year after the iPhone's launch, it could run a grand total of 16 apps. That's right, there was only that one home screen of apps, and that was it. And this wasn't to mention how limited the iPhone was compared to some other devices out there. No MMS, no video camera, no cut and paste, the list goes on. Nokia or Nokia, Blackberry and the rest of the established phone companies had been doing that kind of thing for years. Just to give you an idea of how basic the iPhone's functionalities were back then, jailbreaking your iPhone only got you custom ringtones, and that's it. Of course, this ceased to be the case after the release of the App Store in 2008. For the first time, a device was a blank canvas, and the software creators could make the device be whatever they wanted it to be. Due to the iPod's huge success, there was a huge number of new generation Apple fans, and they just went crazy for this new iPhone. And of course that meant a big market, which meant that everyone wanted to write software and apps for it. For the first time in almost two decades, people were writing software for a brand new platform. Their creativity was only limited by the hardware. And as we all know, the rest is history. Today, billions of apps have been sold, and the mobile app space is pretty much a new industry. Companies like Nokia, Blackberry and Palm thought they knew the game, but they just couldn't see it. They couldn't visualize the future at all. They thought things would never change, and before they realized, it was too late. To prosper in the brave new world of the new mobile industry, a new way of thinking was needed. And one company that possessed that attribute? Google. Midway through the iPod storm, the beginnings of something earth-shattering was brought into the world. In 2003, Andy Rubin and Rich Mina founded a company in Palo Alto, California, named Android Incorporated. Android would play a major role in the late 2000s. The next few years became a blur as the modern world as we know today began to form. Just like the battle between the Macintosh and the PC in the mid to late 80s, the game was once again hot. This time, the tussle was between the iPhone's iOS and the Google Android operating system. In 2008, the first Android phone had arrived. It was the G1. The G1 was the product of the joint effort between Google and HTC. It wasn't bad for a first try, but as expected, there was a lot of room for improvement. The iPhone could basically run circles around the G1 in terms of speed, ease of use, and code efficiency. But Android had something up its sleeve. Android was open source and fully customizable. This was key, as it meant that any individual or company could use Android and tailor it to their liking. This proved to be very effective. And soon, there were Android phones from Samsung, LG, Sony Ericsson, which later became Sony, and many more. This ended up presenting a major challenge to the iPhone, as the customer had much more choice with Android, instead of being locked down with a closed operating system. However, in the early days, Android phones were notorious for lag, and from an outsider's point of view, the iPhone was seen to be vastly superior due to its smooth operation. This was the case up until 2012, when Android version 4.1 Jelly Bean was released. This release saw a drastic change in the underlying code. To not bore you with the details, basically it was more efficient, so much so that the phones ran smoothly at 60 frames per second. Although that performance is arguable, there was definitely an improvement in the phone's performance. And since then, Android phones have been seen as a real serious contender to the iPhone, by everyone and not just Android users. 
by the late 2000s, we began to see something pretty interesting. The phone and operating system that you chose became an indication of your personality. iPhone users were seen a particular way, and Android users were seen a particular way. The humble phone had become so much more than just a device. But why? Our phones had become incredibly personal devices that were all about us. Not only had our smartphones become a gateway to all of the world's information, but for the first time in history, we were in direct contact with anyone in the world from our pockets. Let's take a careful look at how this happened. One of the pivotal parts that would become a major aspect of the world as we know it was the social networking boom. What many people don't know is that social networking can actually be traced back to the mid-90s with sites such as Go Cities and The Globe. Not even to mention that the internet before web browsing was mostly used for socialising with people around the world in forums. But regardless of what the technical roots may have been, it all really started in 2002 with Friendster. This site was hugely popular in the Asian geographical region, with over 115 million users. It showed the potential for social networking. In 2003, a group of people at E-University saw this, and the decision was made to build a social networking site of their own that took strictly the best aspects of Friendster. And within 10 days, MySpace was born. By 2006, MySpace had overtaken Google in daily site visits. The social media boom had begun, but the torch was about to be carried on to something else. What does the advent of Facebook mean? Um, it's obviously not nearly as popular right now as, as MySpace is, but it, it is picking up a little bit of steam. How do you guys deal with that? Yeah, I think um, Facebook is, is quite different. Um, you know, it's mostly people talking to each other that know each other, and MySpace has always been more open. Facebook. Founded in 2004 at Harvard University by Mark Zuckerberg and a few of his roommates, Facebook was the fuse that they lit and the explosion was bigger than they could ever imagine. Today, there are over 1 billion Facebook accounts and at last count, there was over 180,000 terabytes of information. Hot in the heels of Facebook was the SMS of the internet, Twitter. Created by Jack Dorsey in 2006, Twitter has over 500 million users, with over 340 million tweets per day. With the advent of Twitter, it really started being about the here and now. We began to have a kind of second life, an online personal you. But this time, you were no longer anonymous. The true familiar online culture of today had arrived by the mid-2000s, but it was pretty weak. There was something missing. A way for anyone to broadcast themselves, their thoughts, ideas, and creations, much like a TV station or a channel, if you will. Of course, this was YouTube. Without YouTube, this program itself would not exist. It happened in January of 2005. It was up in my place in the city, in San Francisco. Um, and we were having a dinner party and people had uh, digital cameras there and we were taking normal digital photos as well as movies. But when we tried to share the movies, you know, we tried to email it back, but it just kept getting rejected, bounced back. Um, we tried to upload and, you know, we sort of took a look at with all the digital cameras now with phones being able to take take movies, right. but this was going to be more and more of a problem for other people. And we, we try to make and simplify this process to make it as easy as possible to share these videos online. YouTube was founded by Chad Hurley, Steve Chen, and Jawad Karim in 2005. All three were ex-PayPal employees. Just a mere one year later, YouTube was bought by Google. With one hour of video being uploaded every second, YouTube is huge. Millionaires have been made from YouTube, and YouTube has made people famous. As we begin to see more and more Class A content from YouTube, it shows that the internet is no longer just for amateurs, but the place to look for future trends and future talents. And now that everyone has a camera in their pocket, even breaking news can appear from YouTube. YouTube really was a revolution in the way people consume their media. Social media and portable devices have proved to be the ultimate combination. So, by now, all of the technology needed to make our modern lives possible has now fallen into place. As we move through time to the 2010s, the decade where the future meets today, we begin to see a few things. Firstly, smartphones become incredibly powerful 
at a rate which many find hard to keep up with. We see 64-bit mobile operating systems emerge, Intel stepping into the market bringing x86 processors with them. We see glimpses of the very distant future, one example of which is the convergence between the smartphone and the PC. Picture this. In five years time, if your smartphone was as powerful as your PC is today, running PC software, what would that mean for the industry? And what would that mean for you? So now, you've finally seen where our technology has come from, but unfortunately, we're out of time. So come back next time to see the breaking technologies of today and some amazing ideas that really have potential to change our future. You've been watching Cold Fusion TV, and as usual, don't forget to rate, comment, subscribe, and share. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace. And that's the end of episode two. Thanks for watching all the way, guys. Uh, this project is pretty tough. Just uh, for one guy doing everything, it's, uh, it's been a lot more work than I would have expected, but I'm glad the second episode's done, and hopefully you guys learned something. If you're new here and wondering what this channel is all about, a good place to start would be the Cold Fusion TV links in the description below. Enjoy.